Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Deborah Chung. I work with uh, and work for Dr. Paul Barclay at the University of Calgary. I have always been interested in how light interacts with matter and how I might control the flow of light inside that. And it turns out at the nano scale, this is the entire point of the field of now. So I spent my summer uh, learning how to fabricate nanoprotonic devices at um, the National Institute of Technology in Edmonton. And I was working on, and I'm still working on, how to optimize my group's uh, fabrication recipe for microdisks. And we're moving on to, um, we want to use the new material, diamond, and we want to uh, know what the effect of diamond is will be on our devices. So nanoprotonic devices are wave paths that localize electromagnetic energy into optical resonances or modes. And if you've been following the Nobel Prize this year in physics, um, that was given for confining a single photon inside an optical cavity. Um, and nanoprotonic devices are optical cavities, just the same. So um, you can see the response of these uh, optical resonances as um, absorption dips inside one of the spectrum. So each of the resonant wavelengths of each absorption dip corresponds to a resonant wavelength of a mode inside the cavity. So I study microdisks. Our group uses microdisks to couple light in and out of prototype devices, such as this um, beam device. Uh, microdisks are also used to uh, examine nanoparticles, they're also used in quantum computing and environmental sensing. And they're also used to uh, study optical properties of new materials by mounting a disk of a known material onto a substrate of an unknown material. This is what I'm going to do later. Um, so we use microdisks because they're, uh, the modes that they support are easy and relatively quick to simulate, and we know how to make good microdisks. So how do I get light inside one of my micro discs? I use a fiber optic, um, and this fiber optic has been warmed and tapered, and the diameter of this tapered region is 100 times less than the diameter of the surrounding fiber. So the tapered region has a diameter of around one or two microns. This means that the light that's traveling inside the fiber, its evanescent field extends quite far into the air. And if I bring this evanescent field close to one of my light disks, it actually, photons from the fiber actually couple into a supported mode in my micro disk. Now, the most interesting modes of a micro disk are called whispering bell modes. And these are, they're named for their acoustic analog. So if you've heard of the whispering gallery in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, or if you've ever been in a small dome circular room, like an observatory dome, if you stood at one side and got a friend to stand on like directly across from you at the other side of the room, then if you get them to whisper to you, you actually hear them as though they're standing inside your head. It's really cool. So you're actually standing in a supported node and there's several other nodes of sound that the group can support. Turns out this is an analogous to how photons behave in micro disk. In an ideal simulation, you see that there are nodes and actinodes that are supported in <coughs> around the edges of the disk. So this is really cool because you can see from a simulation, and you can see this in practice, that you can, using a microdisk, you localize energy in accessible areas of the device. So this is all ideal, but in real um, devices, such as those using quantum computing, you want to be able to tune the rest of of these devices so that their absorption peaks are very, very narrow. But in real devices, you get optical losses due to um, irregularities in the shape of these devices and irregularities in the surfaces of these devices. So we parameterize the performance of these devices as um, the quality factor of the device. Um, we could call this the Q. So the Q is the ratio of the resonant wavelength over the width of the uh, absorption peak. And this is related to the energy that's stored in the device by uh, ex an exponential, exponential K. And then the K constant is related to the inverse Q. This means that um, uh, high Q devices store en more energy for a longer period of time. So high Q devices are devices that we want to be able to so the two 
major sources of optical loss in advice that I studied are photon absorption and photon scattering. Uh, two photon absorption is a nonlinear effect that's dependent on the power that we put into a device. So if we want to put in more energy, we're limited by the power. Um, and we might also run into linear absorption, which is due to intrinsic from testing our disk. Uh, photon scattering is another significant effect. So we can't make perfectly round, smooth micro disks. We're going to get um, intrinsic roughness even in this high Q optimized uh, device. Um, it turns out that there is a technique to um, uh, it turns out that there's a technique that we can use in the application of these micro disks to minimize the scattering in these disks. But what scattering does is that um, in the uh, device, um, in the spectrum of the device, you see instead of a single peak, you see dots. And this is because um, the whispering melody modes, there's a circulating mode and an anti circulating mode. These are due to in simulations, you expect these to be degenerate. And in reality, because photons going one be scattered differently, photons go the other way. Um, this lives the degeneracy between circulating and anti-circulating modes. So how do I make one of these disks? I pattern um, surface of use silicon. So I pattern silicon with something called an electron beam resist. And I draw one of these circles onto the disk. So this area is exposed silicon, and this area is protected by the resist. So when I go to etch one of my samples, <laughs> then this area will be etched away. And this middle area will be the beginnings of the disk. Um, the problem is that when I write this pattern, there's um, roughness inside in the line of the pattern, and this is transferred into the um, this is transferred into roughness in the etching of my disks. So what I can do is I can um, warm up my resist so that the edges of the pattern start to slump down and smooth out. And this transfers into more a smoothly etched micro disk. The problem is with this is that this the edges of these patterns are no longer uh, they're no longer vertical, but they're slightly sloped. So I have to I have to balance the temperature that I use to um, warm up my resist with the I have to balance the temperature that I use to warm up my resist with the um, smoothness that I want to achieve in the pattern. So after I go to edge, this is an example of one of my mishandled disks. So this one has a load, and you can see there's large scale roughness in the edge. So this <coughs> device is not going to have very high Q. Um, most of my reflow devices actually have a more promising smooth reflow, and there's very um, the the roughness in this is uh, very low scale. But it turns out that I want to look at even smaller scale roughness to be able to discern the differences and be able to look at temperatures that um, correspond to um, that a uh, smoother. So once I have optimized the fabrication of my group's uh, recipe for making micro disks, we will move on to um, make to look at the effects of new materials in on the performance of devices that we make in those new materials. So we use silicon right now because it's um, widely used in medical electronics and the devices that we make we need to integrate into existing medical electronics. Um, we are well familiar with how it behaves in silicon um, and we know how to make silicon devices. Um, uh, silicon is transparent. Infrared, we use infrared lights because telecommunication systems use it. And in order to confine light like, closely in silicon, silicon needs to have a high index of refraction to the surrounding medium. Why do we want to move away from silicon? Two-photon absorption is uh, 
significant in silicon at the way that we use. Also, um, the devices that we use are mounted onto blocks and or suspended in air, and these are bad heat sinks. So as our devices collect light, they also heat up, and this affects the cube of our devices. So we move on to diamond. We're experimenting with diamond because diamond is an excellent thermal conductor. Um, it's transferred to a wide weight of fridge, so we're not restricted to silicon. We can also use silicon phosphide or another semiconductor. Um, the inverse refraction of diamond is between our silicon and our silicon medium, so light is still combined in silicon. Also, for our interest in quantum computing, uh, diamond supports doping qubits such as uh, nitrogen vacancy centered impurities. So, I'm working on um, optimizing the uh, fabrication of our metrogis using mass reflow, which we described before. Um, and I will use metrogisks once they've been optimized. To, I will mount them onto diamond and I will prepare them with silicon, on, uh, silicon dioxide. And I will then be able to look at the effects of diamond on a cube of micro disc. I uh, would like to very much thank my group for introducing me to nanophotonics. And if I somehow manage to spark an interest in nanophotonics, my supervisor will be at the grad fair tomorrow. Thank you very much. afterwards to smooth out the, the surfaces just by heating it up and then it'll sort of smooth out doing the surface tension? Um, it's, these are like after I etch them. Um, so this electron beam resist is used to protect the disc while it's etching, to define the etch, etching process. Mm -hmm. So then they'll be removed and then we just left with the uh, silicon uh, disc. So you can't really anneal that anymore. You can um, there is a technique to um, maybe polish it with some uh, SEM uh, electron beam, um, but at this stage you can't really, there's, it doesn't really mean anything to anneal the pattern, but it's, I guess this is an obvious annealing, um, which is heat up the resist and let it melt a little. Does that answer your question? 